Hey Roy, great to talk to you. Hey Jim, likewise. Hey, so I was just reading through your blog here. It looks like you're doing some pretty interesting testing about AWS Wavelength on Verizon's network. Yeah, 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 I did. Um, yeah, we, we got to uh, get our hands on with uh, AWS Wavelength on Verizon. Uh, bought ourselves a 5G phone, drove around San Jose, did some testing initially. And then after we shared our initial results with uh, AWS and Verizon, uh, we got access to Verizon's uh, remote labs, so remote access to San Francisco, Boston, and New York City to use a bunch of phones to do more testing. So that was pretty good. Excellent. So uh, let's talk a little bit about AWS and the whole premise. So this is really the premise of an edge network connected to 5G, right? Correct, yeah. So AWS Wavelang is uh, Amazon's offering for a mobile edge computing uh, solution. And the mobile edge platform is an extension of their Elastic Cloud, right? So the ECC, EC2 um, solution. It extends into different uh, metro regions, if you will. They, they're they announcing a whole slew of partnerships, you know, KDDI, you know, uh, Vodafone and, and so on. But Verizon is the first one that actually is launching or has launched. Um, so they have seven sites today uh, across the US as, as of right now. The promise is 10 by the end of the year. So the, the proposition here is really to the application developers, right, who would be hosting an application in AWS. Here's an opportunity to host it in facilities that are co-located with a carrier right on their mobile network. That is correct, yes, so, exactly. So as a developer who may already be familiar with Amazon's cloud services with AWS, then the promise of this is to run application components or full applications at the edge, if you will, and that's located right at the packet gateway. So at the exit points from the mobile network, as they get onto the internet, the AWS Wavelength servers will be right there. And so it promises right. the, the uh, well, at least at this point in time, the lowest latency uh, possible. Yeah, so, so that's the promise really, right? Or the, the, the hype, I guess you could even say with edge services is that as an application developer, you're going to get to run your application as close as possible to your end user, presumably at a premium over hosting it in AWS in one of their regional data centers, right? Correct. Yes, it's actually about a 20% premium thereabouts. So for the same services or the same compute services, uh, you would pay a 20% premium for running in Wavelang. Uh, Wavelang, obviously, because they are limited in, in real estate size, it's not as big as a, one of their regional you know, uh, public cloud data centers. And so it has a limited subset of all the AWS services. Not all services are available. Not all of the instance types, if you will, are, are available as well. But certainly it's, it's, it's wide enough in terms of the breadth to run a good number of workloads. Uh, there are GPU assistant ones, uh, and obviously the standard ones as well. Um, uh, interesting. Yeah, so uh, of course we know it's early days for edge and edge deployments and applications that would be specially tuned for those types of hosting. Um, but what did you find? I mean, I haven't seen really anyone else doing this kind of performance testing on an edge network publicly available at this point. So what, what did you find? Yeah, so what we found, at least in the sites that we tested, uh, was that latency does vary. Now, um, AWS and Verizon are quite very quite careful in terms of promising ultra low latencies. So those you know sub 10 milliseconds, sub five millisecond promises that they're not making and they point out it's early days yet. Um, and part of it is because 5G, in terms of 5G rollouts, a lot of those are still 5G non-standalone meaning a 4G mobile core with a 5G radio, which has more latency than what a full 5G implementation or standalone would have. And so they're talking about latencies in the 20, 30 millisecond range, which is pretty low. Uh, typically, you'd see 50 to 100 on some mobile networks. It depends, right? Some mobile networks are better. But what we did find was this, was that um, we found that by running on Wavelang in some places, that you would get someone in the 15 millisecond, 18 millisecond reduction, right? So... Essentially, if you were getting somewhere in the 40 or 50 range, you would get in the 25 to 30 range um, in terms of your latency reduction. And so, so that's what we, one thing we found. The second thing we found was that this wasn't the case across all locations. So San Francisco being, I guess, the Bay Area being a little special because San Francisco actually has a NorCal uh, public cloud, a, a region from, from AWS. 
there was no appreciable difference between the SF wavelength site and that NorCal location, if you will. Latency-wise or throughput-wise, it was more or less identical. And so okay. would you pay a 20% premium? I think it depends, right? And, that, that, and obviously, it's not fully rolled out yet. Topology will improve. And so you may see yeah. more substantial differences. But in Boston and New York, we were able to find a, a, a difference in the performance numbers. And so if you look at those numbers, I think the question is, um, would you be willing to pay a 20% premium uh, for 20 to 40% latency reduction? No difference in throughput really though. So the throughput, you know, gigs per second was about the same, whether you were talking okay. to region or wavelength, but you would see, you know, a 20 to 40% latency reduction. And so the question is, if your app is latency sensitive, you might be willing to pay that premium. Um, and I think what Verizon and AWS point out is that this will improve as time goes on. So the latency uh, at the wavelength sites will, will continue to decrease as they improve the topology and as they roll out wavelength sites. Um, okay, interesting, interesting. Can you tell me a little bit about the, the methodology that you were doing? I mean, how were you actually testing this and coming up with this data? Yep, sure. So we started with a real mobile phone, a Samsung S20 with uh, enabled for 5G millimeter wave, which was pretty cool. Um, and then we drove around San Jose looking for these uh, millimeter wave spots, if you will. Uh, and what we were able to do was lock in and then we ran a script and we tested using ping um, the round trip time, and we use uh, a tool called iPerf3 to look at the throughput, and that's quite well uh, accepted among network technologists in terms of uh, throughput testing. And so iPerf3 gave us essentially the TCP and UDP throughput, and we use ping for lack of a better tool at this point in time to do round trip times. Now, what I will okay. point out is that uh, you know some carriers like Verizon do traffic management, and so sometimes pings, which are dependent on the ICMP protocol, may be reduced in priority compared to say TCP traffic, right? So, so you may, the absolute numbers, we want to, want to be careful about interpreting them as absolute, uh, but the relative comparison between sites, right? Traffic management is consistent. They're not going to manage you a little differently, <laughs> wavelength versus non-wavelength. And so um, that relative measure, I think makes sense. Uh, and okay. we're looking at improving the methodology in the future. We have other techniques that have been suggested, you know, in terms of more accurate TCP, round trip times, and we're looking at those for future testing. Okay. You also mentioned that you got some access to Verizon's own test facilities. What, what, what was that about? Yeah, so that was that's correct. So one of the one of the uh, things we were hoping to do was to uh, get some of our SE friends in the field to drive around in some of those uh, you know seven regions or six beyond SF and to test, to run the scripts that, that we had written to, uh, to execute a test. Uh, Verizon actually offered a way to shortcut that to say they, they have remote testing facilities in these locations, which are actual phones sitting in labs using public uh, public radio. So these are actually public cell sites, um, not their own private public cell sites. And the phones are attached to those public cell sites. They just happen to be sitting in the lab and they give you remote access. So it's like a, a Samsung phone or a Motorola phone that you have remote access to. So we were able to remote log into those phones, execute our scripts, and then pull the results back. And uh, by way of comparison, we did our test in the SF uh, remote lab and compared it to our San Jose results, and they were comparable. So they were very similar, which leads yeah. us to believe they're probably, uh, you know, on a real world network, uh, real phones, right? Not uh, Yeah, so, so it's interesting. The, the One of the big takeaways was that in the same location or in the same metro then, the latency difference wasn't all that substantial. So that would be you're in the San Francisco Bay Area and you're hitting a wavelength facility versus uh, an AWS facility that is also in the Bay Area. And so I guess it's the speed of light differential between... Yeah, it's the um, speed of light yeah, differential is one. Uh, two is the number of hops topology-wise. And I think one of the things here is that I think uh, MNOs, uh, mobile network operators like Verizon, probably have optimized paths to AWS already. And um, you could, the same would be for Google and for, for Microsoft, right? So they already have optimized paths to improve their quality of service for the existing consumers who are consuming services on AWS or, or GCP or Azure. And so that path is actually quite optimized. And so if you, have, if you happen to have, I think, a cloud region near you, then I don't know if the mobile edge site would add that much more. So maybe you'll shave off a millisecond or two in the future, 
uh, then the question is, you know, is it worth the premium? And so if you look at where all these cloud locations are, you know, you look at AWS, which has Oregon, right, Ohio, North Virginia, in those sites, would you use Wavelength? I don't know. Um, and then likewise, right. you know, if, if Azure were rolling out, you would think about, you know, Azure on AT&T, you would say, hey, look, um, do we, should we actually use the mobile sites or should we use the cloud? Unclear at this point in time, right? Our testing says okay. differential is not substantial. But again, this this is the first round of testing. Their networks are in the process of still being optimized, so we'll see. Right. Right. Of course, latency isn't the only reason that you would be going for an edge service. Um, you might have yep. data gravity or proximity yeah, or, or uh, security issues or other reasons like that that you'd want to keep data at the edge. Ability that maybe you have... Uh, we have wavelength sites in different countries, say in the EU region, where countries are much packed more closely together. And maybe for data jurisdiction uh, reasons, you may want to use a wavelength site in your country, whereas the region that's in the country next, you know, next door to you uh, may not be appropriate. So I've, I could see situations like that. Likewise, it's not just the speed of light and latency, it's the number of hops. And so the premise is that as we roll out 5G infrastructure, that the front hall is going to be more optimized with less hops and less variability. And so by using Wavelang, presumably, or any other mobile edge solution, um, you would reduce the variability in the front end. Uh, and you're not constricted by the back hall uplinks. So from these packet gateway sites, right, these uh, mobile service, uh, mobile switching offices or mobile switching centers, there's a back hall problem. So if it gets congested in the back, you may see variability. Whereas on the front, you have essentially, you know, more or less what the front hall bandwidth is available to you, right? Yeah, it's interesting stuff. I'm, I'm really glad you're working on this, Roy. Um, it's early days, of course, but um, it also helps extend our conversation on our Next Gen Infra site, uh, where yeah. we are collecting a lot of opinions and, and um, viewpoints, uh, thought leadership pieces from across the industry on edge architecture. And certainly this question of latency and performance is one I would expect we're going to hear from a lot of people. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, the, the edge and beyond side that we have together on next-gen infrastructure has, has received you know, a lot of accolades and a lot of people have been downloading reports. And, and we thought that, you know, what better, there's no better way than to do hands-on, right? Not talk about it, but actually do it. And, and as you point out, I think we're the first ones to go public with information around what real world latencies and throughput are like in basically the world's first production mobile edge uh, solution, right? So, so we thought that was pretty fun. Yeah, yeah good stuff. Well, well thanks, Roy. Let, let's keep building. Yeah, no, and it's been a good experience. And I mean, I think to, to be fair to the guys over at AWS and Verizon, they, they've been extremely helpful and supportive and pretty candid right. in the conversations that we've had with them. And so, I, you know, it's, it's early days and they recognize it, but, but I'm glad they rolled it out so that we all have a chance to try it out. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks again. Thanks, Jim.